practice, process, and passion. Business of Architecture, episode 395. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. My name is Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and fulfilling architecture practice. Today, you'll hear my interview with Andrew Foreman. Andrew runs an architecture practice in Hawaii called Blueprint 808. Andrew's practice has been awarded for consecutive years as Hawaii's home and remodeling's Reader's Choice architecture firm. Blueprint 808 specializes in custom home designs and is dedicated to improving the design and constructions that are completed in Hawaii. In today's episode, we're going to talk about what it's like to start from scratch, starting a small architecture firm, and also, specifically, Andrew's thoughts about how he's embracing a, an innovative business model as he continues forward with his practice. With that, let's jump into my interview today with architect Andrew Foreman. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices, Business of Architecture's step-by-step -step business training program for architects that shows you how to structure your practice so you can focus on doing your best work instead of being bogged down with the complexity of running a business. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. Build the business you need to do the work that you want. Andrew, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you for having me. Explain to us what's the difference of a design-build firm versus a design-build team. What do you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Um, so I think a, a, a brief backstory would probably be the best way to explain it. Um, and I am sure everybody's going to be familiar with some of the terms that I throw out. But uh, originally, just starting out in the profession of architecture, I worked for the traditional design bid build firm, a relatively large firm that would uh, go through the design process on, in this case, very large projects and very large buildings uh, across the world, actually. Um, and they would take equally large amounts of time and effort. Um, and after about 10 years or so of doing this, I realized that um, it was routine that we would go through this design process. And for one reason or another, the projects just wouldn't end up working out um, and wouldn't ever get built. Uh, and if they did get built, it would be a, a long, arduous, sometimes stressful and expensive process. Um, so worked for the traditional firm for almost 10 years um, and then ended up working for a builder for about five years. Um, actually, two different builders uh, went to the mainland and worked for them. And it was a, a design build uh, firm. Uh, we focused on remodeling and um, it was of a much smaller scale. The value in that is that I got to obviously work for a builder. So I got to see the day in, day out sort of operation of what's actually happening on a construction site. Um, and it was of a scale of type of project that was actually uh, my favorite type of project, residential work. So there was a lot of value in doing that. Um, but being a design build firm, it employed designers and builders all under one roof. And uh, I did find that there were some issues uh, with that, um, a few of them being just uh, some concern on homeowner, uh, uh, I think, trust issues, um, having everybody be employed under one roof. Um, and then when things went wrong, sometimes there was nobody that was there to sort of support either the homeowner or the builder because there's a little bit of a conflict of interest. Um, so I think there were there were some some a lot of positives to the design build firm, but there were some things that I thought could be improved as well. So um, I think like most architects, uh, ultimately we want to go out on our own. So once I'd gotten my license, uh, had it for a while, or actually a pretty short while to be honest, um, I got the itch to start my own business um, and I knew that I wanted to be a design build team um, and that's uh, that's the differentiator here is a design build team so I wanted to be an independent sole practitioner architecture firm that would team up with contractors and builders that we trusted um, so that was fundamentally the concept behind the design build team rather than the design build firm now, you mentioned that when you worked in the construction side of the industry that you discovered what builders actually use just in terms of a set of plans or architectural deliverables. What did you mean by that? That's a good question. So um, it was sort of eye-opening, actually, because uh, to be honest, I, I would say that they're probably using about 25% of the 
the work that we're putting in there. So um, as far as just merely a construction or a permit document standpoint. Um, so something that uh, I knew, this is, this is, I don't want to make this a long-winded answer, but I knew that there was efficiency issues um, between the design process, getting permit and construction documents completed, um, and then giving them to the contractor to bid on, and then finally what they would actually use to build it. Um, and then there was also a disconnect between a designer and architect designing something and then the builder maybe never even knowing that designer or that architect. And they just sort of make assumptions along the way or not ask questions or ask questions but not to the right person. So a lot of the stuff that you were doing during the design end wasn't actually being translated into the construction side of things. Um, so when the designer is actually on site and can answer things actively, or if there's a builder that's in the office while he's designing something, you can design it appropriately in ways that a builder is actually going to build the thing. Um, you know, I think that's a, there needs to be clear uh, differentiation between what an architect does and what a builder does. And oftentimes, just I, don't, uh, I hate to say it, but I think it's the nature of an architect to think that he knows everything, um, which is the furthest from the truth, obviously, especially when it comes to actually building it. Um, so, you know, I think a perfect example would be, uh, you know, we're spending, uh, you know, ridiculous amounts of time detailing out a, you know, a, a window jam or something like that. And a builder builds and frames windows all day long, you know, and they don't need us to sit there drawing out that detail because you can give them the concept and then you can give them the basic specifications of what you're trying to accomplish. And in the design build format and the design build team, the intent would be if they had any questions or if they needed additional detail or information that they could ask you. But you're not having to spend all of this effort and this time up front doing something that they might not ever use. Um, so it was basically shifting responsibilities from pre-construction to construction. So it just made it more efficient um, and it just gave them the information they actually needed. It didn't waste anybody's time for stuff they didn't. Now, and the distinction between a design build team versus the design build firm, as you explained, is that a team is more of sort of a partnership. Design build firm, you have it in-house or, or something of the sort. What's your structure and how did you form those relationships? Tell us about that. Yeah, sure. So structure-wise, as a company, it consists of two people. It consists of myself doing the architectural portion um, and then my wife doing essentially the business portion, the accounting portion, the contracts, everything that I'm not good at, which is quite a lot. Um, but I am pretty good at the architectural portion. So um, as far as uh, just sort of getting the business up and running, it was literally from a seed in the ground that we just planted with an idea that's grown in and blossomed into something quite beautiful, actually. So it was about three years ago, and it was just literally me getting out and introducing myself to people. And I'm not exaggerating to say it was probably – I maybe not a hundred people in a hundred days, but maybe 75 people over a hundred days where it was coffee or it was lunch. And it was just, you know, giving them an idea of what I was trying to accomplish, what I like to do, who I like to work with, how I like to do it. Um, and, you know, of all these different resources that I was reaching out to, whether it's a builder or an engineer or another designer or a real estate agent, obviously I think the most closely associated was the builder. Um, so going to these meetings with builders, you know, the majority of them, honestly, they didn't fully grasp on what I was spitting out, <laughs> but for a handful of them, they did. And for a handful of them, they really actually appreciated what an architect does. And they understood that that would actually make their time and efforts more valuable on their part because they wouldn't have to worry about what we're doing and spend time asking more questions and things along those lines. So. It was very much just the connections and the relationships worked where we each valued each other's skill and clearly understood the differences. Um, so now that it's been three years, we have three builders that we probably complete 75% of our work with. Um, and then the other 25% is scattered among various other builders, new builders that we've just recently met or um, people that a homeowner maybe having maybe has a relationship with, or in certain cases, even an owner builder. Uh, that sounds pretty nice. That it sounds like it's a great way to get projects because a lot of times, let's face it, clients will go to builders because 
a lot of times that's where they start out. Is that the case here? And then they refer the work to you or how do you get most of your projects when you started out? How do you get them now? Yeah, I, I'm still scratching my head why architects aren't just knocking on builders' doors. It boggles my mind. I mean, that was like the most obvious thing in the world to me is, you know, I, I, there, I, I, I use this metaphor, but, you know, most people will go to a doctor or a dentist multiple times a year, so they clearly understand the difference between a doctor and a dentist, right? Most people will go to an architect or a builder maybe one time in their life. If they're lucky, maybe a few times, or if they're unlucky, I'm not sure. But they don't clearly understand the difference between what an architect does and a contractor and a subcontractor and an engineer and a draftsman and a designer. So they don't even know where to start. So they'll just go to a builder because they know that they build things, right? So it was natural for me to go to these builders and present to them what I knew was already an issue for them is that they weren't designers. So unless they were you know, approached with a full set of plans and if they were approached with a full set of plans, they were probably one of three or maybe more builders that were approached with that same set of plans. Um, and you know, their chances were slim in getting these jobs and they were just spending a ton of time estimating projects that they might not ever get. So it just wasn't efficient for them either. You know, I thought this is a very mutually beneficial relationship. Um, and again, I still sort of scratch my head why people aren't understanding that or grasping that maybe, I don't know, I'm not a prophet, I could tell you that, but this seemed like it was fairly obvious to me. <laughs> um, so, um, and it, it worked. So, you know, again, the guys that understood the value of each other, we worked well together. And now I would say easily, um, well, actually, let me, let me step back. Three years ago, 99% of our work came from these builders. Last year, 50% of it. This year, maybe a third. But it's only happening that way because naturally people are starting to understand who we are. So they're starting to see more projects get built. Uh, our name is just getting out there, right? So from a marketing standpoint, it was all foot traffic and just going through the builder as our main network source in the first year. And the second year was the first time we'd ever tried any advertising other than just, again, word of mouth, basically, but we started doing Instagram. And it just, it was actually, we probably got five projects, maybe even more from Instagram. Um, what was then, your Instagram strategy, Andrew? Uh, infiltration, <laughs> just putting as much out there as possible. Um, and, you know, it was, it, it was something that was a behind the scenes look, I guess you could say, you know, where the website mm. is, Hey, this is what we've completed. The Instagram page was like, this is how we're completing it. And, mm. you know, again, continuously on, on any interview that a homeowner would have with me, they would always ask, well, you know, what is your process like, or how do you guys do this? Or do you have any projects actively? And, you know, it's a really hard question to answer when you don't. But it's really easy when you're like, yeah, just go take a look at my Instagram site. I got 20 active projects right now. And if you want to see exactly what it looks like when the sausages get made, it ain't pretty. But look at what it turns out to be, right? And then they see that stuff, and it's not like you're even having to tell them. It's like they can go back on the thread a year and see that you were working on that project, and it had just started. And then, you know, now it's a year later, and the project's done. So it's not, hey, we can complete a project in a year. It's like they can actively see it happening. Um, and then I make sure that like I'll get my clients information at the beginning of the project. And I'll say, hey, you know, can I tag you on these things and say, you know, hey, John's the man. He's helping us out, pick out his countertops or whatever it may be. And then, you know, they give feedback on there and stuff like that. You know, so it's just sort of like an interactive way for people to see that, hey, this is a transparent thing, you know there's a, you know, it's just, they, there's a lot to the process and they, that they never would even imagine, but a lot of it is fun. And if they can see it, it's cool. Um, so that, that, yeah, that was a powerful tool for me. Um, and then um, it, this last year was the first year we ever did paid advertising. So that was sort of like year three, or I guess it was year two, because it was really year three, was really when we started to say, okay, well, let's do some paid advertising. And in my mind, I knew that um, at least the local remodeling magazines, um, or I learned, I can't say I knew, but I learned just after approaching them and trying to like probe them for, hey, put my uh, house that I just designed into your magazine. They weren't real open to that unless you advertise with them. So I thought, ah, okay, well, let's give this a shot. 
you know, because a lot of people, they, they get these free magazines. They're like every Home Depot in the city, right, among other places. So, you know, it was worth a few thousand bucks to advertise. Um, and then that actually has turned into, I don't know that I can, I don't know that I can actively say that that specifically has gotten me projects, but I can actively tell you that um, it's opened up the network quite a bit more where people see us now. And people that do interview us will say, hey, I saw your ad in the magazine or whatever it may be. Uh, so it's been progression, but it's been it's been just sort of learning and listening to people like, you know, on your podcast that I get a lot of these ideas from, to be honest. Amazing. Now, if you had, if you were parachuted into a town where you knew no one and you had to start from over and you needed to get work, and it was the same, it was architecture, you were going to rebuild your firm, what would you do? Same thing. No doubt in my mind. It's like, uh, there, there, there's, there's, the, the, I think the issue is that uh, architects in our nature, uh, I would just say maybe a good portion of them are somewhat introverted, so they're not like the kind of people that are actively outselling themselves, which I think is just, you know, makes it more difficult to procure jobs, obviously. But, um, you know, it's all about who knows you and how many people know you and just plastering yourself wherever you can. Um, but, uh, again, the biggest thing for us is the relationship with that builder and just understanding that, and I'm going to say this loud and clear to all architects out there that need work, go find builders because they got a ton of work they're turning away. And there's architects out here who are just working in their cocoon in their office. And then once they're done with their design documents and their bid documents, they just go shoot them out to builders. Cultivate those relationships with the builders. They should be our best friends. They should be our allies. I mean, they're the people that's going to make our work look incredible. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to be much more open and friendly to do that if we're welcoming and friendly to them. Um, so they can really be our greatest ally. Beautiful. What would you say has been the biggest thing that has helped grow your business, most impactful? Um, it, it, the in, intention. So, you know, uh, in the first year where it was like, you know, we just intend on uh, surviving. <laughs> you know, it's like we'll take any work that we can get. So that was intentional. You know, I don't care if it's a $10,000 carport, I'm doing it. And then, you know, that just naturally ended up being there was quite a few small projects right probably too many to be honest um but uh that was the intention in the first year in the second year you know now we knew sort of okay well we've refined the process we've gotten better with that um we're starting to find certain uh enjoyment in specific types of projects i guess you could say whether it's a addition or remodel a bathroom kitchen whatever it may be um so you know in our second year we were intentional on okay well let's increase what our target budgets would be for the project. Um, let's uh, it become more specific to the builders that we work with and let's really push them as a part of the team aspect, right? And like, now we've got projects, 10 projects completed with that guy. So this year, it's our intention to be like, we have trust and experience with these guys. So let's really push that for, you know, sort of selling our firm. Um, and then in even more so this year, it's I think then the focus on, okay, well, now we've completed a lot of projects efficiently and successfully with people that we now trust um, and have done it time and time again with. So now it's very intentional on really a size requirement, I guess you could say. Um, and the size requirement is all based on the fact that, you know, in our nature, I think architects probably work a lot and I love doing what I do but I would rather work 40 or 50 hours a week than 50 to a hundred hours a week. So, you know, if I can take, you know, a handful of really quality projects that are with builders, I trust and homeowners that I'm friends with, um, I, I want to do that. And that if I only take a few, they just have to be of a larger size. So ultimately that's sort of the, the short answer would be intention with the project type size and people that we're working with. And I love you have, you have these, this, these three P's that you talk about that define the way you work. You talk about practice, process, and passion. Yeah. Yeah. So the practice is the design, build, practice, sole practitioner. 
uh, the passion part is the residential architecture. Um, you know, it wants to be of a small enough scale where it's not residential architecture like, you know, high rise condos, but single family homes and stuff like that. Um, with, and again, just a handful of projects with people that I'm really good friends with. I mean, I just finished a project that, that one of the larger projects I've completed through Blueprint 808. And these guys are without a doubt some of my best friends now. Um, which is a more reward than, you know, the money I ever made from it. Um, and, but I can tell you that the product is actually probably one of the best products we've ever put out too because of that, right? It's just like the, the team just worked. And I'm, I'm talking from the builder to the homeowner to myself. We just all connected and it showed through the results of the project. Um, so that's the passion part of it. The process part of it, um, which I haven't talked in a great detail and I'll try to keep this short. But um, working with with the large firm doing such government federal work and things like that, they have a lot of milestones, deliverables, but it's all with the intent of making sure that you complete each task and, uh, you know, make sure that everything is done that needs to be done to accomplish what you're trying to get done. So um, we've done the same thing and simplified it for the residential portion. So, you know, we've got four phases like probably all, most architects do with schematic design being number one. Design development, design development being number two, construction permit documents being number three, and then construction administration being number four. We have clearly identified four meetings for schematic design, one meeting held once a week, three to four meetings total held over a month for schematic design. Same thing for the design development phase. After schematic design, we sit down with that builder, we get feedback from them, constructability, budget, logistics, just the kind of feedback that you need from a third party, especially somebody that would be interested in building this for you to make sure that you're on the right track. We don't want to start detailing out our cabinets if we're $100,000 over our budget, right? Seems like we need to make bigger stroke changes than changing cabinet hardware. So after schematic phase, we get that uh, gut check, I guess you could call it, go through the three to four meetings held over three to four weeks in design development. After that phase is over, we'll get another gut check. We'll sit down with the builder, make sure that we're still in line with our target relative to our goals of design, budget, schedule, whatever it may be. Then usually the homeowner at that point will work out the details with the contractor. Um, again, two thirds of the time, it'll usually work out with the contractor. There are cases still where a homeowner obviously is like, you know what, it's a little bit more than I expected, but we're in the ballpark. Let's go ask another builder or two. And we'll go get bids. And we've got enough information to accurately go get those bids. In that same time, whether they're contracting with the builder we've worked with or obtaining some bids, Blueprint 808 will create our permit, our permit documents and submit them to the city. Permit documents are super specific in that they're exactly what the city needs to see, nothing more, nothing less. So submit it to the city. Um, because there's nothing more, nothing less, it makes the city process efficient. In Honolulu, we've got a relatively, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what the right word is. It's, it could be slow, I guess, in, at the Department of Planning and Permitting in Honolulu if you don't approach it the right way. But we've got it down pretty efficiently, just because we've done it the same way so often. Um, in that time frame, we've got milestones and deliverables and checklists that we're trying to hit. We're procuring materials, we're, you know, uh, finalizing shop drawings. We're completing construction documents that the permit, the city didn't need to see in the permit documents. And then naturally, usually it takes about three to four months to get a permit. We'll have completed all that uh, necessary work. We'll have procured our materials. We'll have contracted with our builder. And then we can start the construction. So I can't even remember the question, but that was the answer. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, you're, you're three Ps and you just ended up talking about the go. process, which is great. Look. You know, with, with the entire with the entire business and uh, everything that you're doing, interesting. Is is there anything that you've been listening to the podcast for a while? Anything that you wish that uh, or that you wanted to say that I haven't asked about that you really feel has been a learning or a lesson for you? Um, I, I think something that I've noticed like has been a trend recently is the ability for people to sort of just make it easier on themselves and make it easier on the homeowner. Um, and when I say easier, I'm thinking about that in a few different angles, but I think a big part of it is that 
you know, there's the old school way of doing things. And that's just like the traditional architectural way. You pull out rolls of trace paper and, you know, you start sketching stuff. And if you want to make a change and you're going over with another roll of trace, blah, blah, blah. Now people are doing things very digitally. And it's almost like I, you had a podcast a few weeks ago and it was a father and son. And it was like the father, I think, had left a really big firm that he had owned. And then the son had just started and they had like done some, I think it was a resort or something like that. And it was like super uber successful. And it was just an interesting uh, combination where there was this modern understanding, but the traditional values. And I think that we need to keep the values, the traditional values of architecture, which obviously are the critical important part. But we have to bring this into like modern times. This isn't, you know, 1950 anymore. This is people are using go to meetings like we should use that <laughs> you know like people don't need to drive a half hour to come over to your office they can do it in their sweatpants on their couch you know and especially in times like now where like most people can't even leave their house why does business have to stop we've been more successful in the last eight weeks than we were for eight months before that and a big part of that is because people go onto our instagram site people go onto our website and we say you know, your meetings are going to be held from the comfort of your own couch. You know, your meetings, everything that they have access to, it's all in folders on Google that they can just go to. It's no problem. They can view their model of their home in 3D on their desktop, and it's easy. I have clients that are 75 that have done it. You know, and it's like it's not rocket science. It's just you might need to teach them a little bit, but it's coming together with the times. I think there's a lot of people that are doing that now, but it's blending the old with the new. So, yeah, amazing. Now I'm wondering about the design, the design team model. How often does it become an issue where, you know, the clients like, well, I want to get another bid. You know what I'm saying? So that they basically, I'm sure you prefer, you know, it's, it's nice if the builder brings you the lead, the builder would probably hope that they, that they, they end up using that builder. I'm sure they understand that that's not always going to be the case, but how often is it that clients Let's face it, when you get back a bid, it's always going to seem high. Yes, it, it's rarely on target, that's for sure. So I would say, you know, where, where I suggested that it's probably two-thirds of the time that the builder that we start with is the builder that builds it, I would say about 50% of the time, we will end up going out and getting bids of some sort. So, you know, there's that 15% difference where usually it'll actually – you know, it goes to the builder at the end of the day anyways. What I have noticed, and I don't know if this is a, a, a local thing or if this is just, you know, a national thing or what, but uh, once a project gets to a certain scale, and I honestly think it's somewhere around three quarters of a million to a million dollars, I think the builders start to really even out on their costs. Where you probably will have a good amount of fluctuation on a project that's a quarter of a million dollars. And, you know, there's certain builders out there that honestly, sometimes they just don't even want to take a project on that's that size. Or there's a builder that's just starting and a $250,000 project is like, oh, awesome, let's take it. So they'll be really affordable. So there's like this big spectrum of change. So what I've noticed on, as again, Blueprint Data Weights projects increase in value, I've noticed that the variations in the estimates decrease in difference, I guess you could say. Um, and I try to imply that every time we meet. So in every meeting that we hold, we talk about four things. Design is paramount. That's the first thing. Second thing is budget. Third thing is schedule. And fourth thing is next steps. So we will talk about those four things at every meeting and it will go from a macro level to the eighth meeting is a micro level, right? We're going to know down to the cabinet hardware. But at least we're understanding, even in a very broad schematic design phase, where they are with costs. And I'm not just coming up with those numbers arbitrarily. I'm working with these builders on a project by project basis, a lot of them. So, you know, I've done 10 projects of a $500,000 scale. I know roughly, you know, how it's going to break up even from the very beginning, you know, and we'll look at it from a price per square foot basis to start with. Then we'll look at it at a price per trade. Then we'll add in allowances and materials to these things. So it, it adds levels of detail and it adds levels of confidence that everybody is clearly understanding of where the budget is, regardless of that's where they want it. They're clearly understanding of where the budget is, so that by the time they do go contract with the builder, again, 50% of the time, they're actually confident enough that, you know, this is just what it is. 
but there's still those people out there that just naturally want to go, you know, uh, test the waters, which I understand too. Um, and we'll do that. And, you know, sometimes it just ends up being somebody else that's working with us and that's fine too, but, uh, the nature of the business. Got it. Well, Andrew, I mean, it's so cool that you've been a long time listener and you're able to come here on the show with us and, and now share your story. And I encourage, I mean, there's probably other listeners listening to this right now thinking, Hey, I want to get on the show pretty soon, or I want to be Randers. I'd love to start my own firm. So what, what an amazing thing to have you on here today. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks. Appreciate it. And that is a wrap. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practice Business of Architecture step-by-step executive training program for firm owners who want a practice that gives them freedom, creative fulfillment, and financial reward. Because you see, likely it isn't your skill as an architect or your skill as a designer that holds you back in architecture. It's everything else related to running a business. Redoing staff work, trying to find the right people, keeping the right people, and keeping the money flowing so it all runs smoothly. If you're ready to stop reinventing the wheel, get a proven system, and simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash training to discover a free video where you'll discover the smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of your architecture. As a reminder, the views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.